So without further ado, I am honored to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nigel Haroon, who will be presenting an overview on the medical management of spinal arthritis. He's also going to provide some research updates for us. Dr. Nigel Haroon is the president of the Canadian Rheumatology Association and is head of the Division of Rheumatology at the University Health Network and Sinai Health. He's an associate professor of medicine and rheumatology at the University of Toronto and a senior scientist at the Krembel Research Institute and the Schroeder Arthritis Institute. Dr. Haroon is an internationally renowned clinician scientist in the field of ankylosing spondylitis. Dr. Haroon also serves on the board of the Spondyloarthritis Research and Treatment Network, also known as Spartan, as well as on the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of the Spondylitis Association of America and the Can Canadian Spondylitis Association. Dr. Haroon has won several awards, including the Jane Brukel ECI Research Award from SAA. So welcome, Dr. Haroon. We are thrilled to have you as our first presenter. I am going to turn over the controls so you can share your slide. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. And I was I was wondering why so many people had registered. I thought I was the main gig in town, and now I know you have got so many interesting games and and giveaways and everything. So no wonder. So I'll begin by, by thanking Spondylitis Association of America and UML for the kind invitation and the opportunity to address this important topic. I've been associated with the Spondylitis Association of America for many years now. And uh, just, just um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the NIH and the entire conference was organized by the Spondylitis Association of America from the money they have raised. And the topic of the uh, of the meeting was um, uh, unmet needs in, in axial spondyloarthritis. And that was the fourth meeting since 1998. So we bring together world experts and uh, discuss what the challenges uh, that we need to tackle over the next 10 years is. And we work as a team trying to solve these questions. And so you can see the importance of the work that Spondylitis Association of America is doing. And again, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, so today, uh, uh, Let's see, I think you can see my slides now. So my idea for, for today is to talk, give you a, a little bit of an uh, idea about um, uh, the pathogenesis of AS and um, a brief update. We won't go into a lot of details and I'll let you know that the, the slides may look busy and complicated, but I will try to take you through the slides in a very, very, very simple way and easy to understand me. And of course, if there are doubts and if you want clarifications on any particular area, you can put it in the Q&A and we can address it at that time. Uh, so after the section on pathogenesis, we move on to treatment. And specifically in treatment, I want to um, cover these three areas, um, the currently available treatment options that are approved for axial SPA. We talk about the very important concept of window of opportunity. Uh, we'll also talk about biologic tapering, which is uh, being discussed more and more now, and hopefully in the near future will become standard of, uh, of, of care for axial spondyloarthritis. Okay, so when we talk about uh, pathogenesis, we always consider the environment and genes, and as very evident from this figure, the role of genes is quite prominent in, in ankylosing uh, spondylitis. And the very first evidence of uh, the importance of genes came from um, twin studies. Uh, you will see here in this top line here, monozygotic twin pairs, dizygotic twin pairs. So monozygotic twin pairs come from the same zygote. So they have greater gene sharing. And the number that you see here is the concordance, rate of concordance. So if one twin has AS, <laughs> what percentage of all twins uh, would have this, where the second twin also would have AS. And you can see that both twins um, are affected in the monozygotic twin pairs as opposed to only 20% for uh, dizygotic um, uh, twin pairs. Um, so clearly when there is greater gene sharing, there's a greater chance that the disease will occur uh, similarly. Okay, 
Now, if you look at um, family studies, which will be the second uh, level of evidence that you can uh, look for, um, at the bottom in the x-axis, you, you see the degree of relationship. So, uh, you know, degree three, two, one, and then the, the most, the closest genetic relationship would be twins. And on the y-axis is the concordance, and similar to the concordance numbers you saw above, let's see how the degree of relationship affects the uh, concordance of disease. And clearly, twin studies, 50 to 60. Now, in this particular study, 63% of uh, twins have disease together. Uh, among first degree relatives, so this is an interesting number that you can keep in mind. What is the ch if one person has AS in the family, what is the chance that another person in the first degree relationship would have AS? It's only 10%. Uh, the same number can be applied to uh, the next generation. So this is a question that often comes up in clinic. Um, I have been diagnosed with AS. I'm worried about my kids. What is the chance that my kid will have AS? Do I need to test them? Do I need to do an MRI in the kids? Do I need to do B27 for my kids? And the answer is always, uh, no, you don't need to worry about that at all. Unless, unless they they develop some kind of a symptom and then we can do investigations. Otherwise, there is no need to be worried because there is only a 10% chance that uh, somebody in the next generation would develop uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Now, if we know that uh, um, the, the, uh, if, the, if the parent is B27 positive and the kid is also B27 positive, even then the risk increases to only 20%. So essentially eight to nine out of 10 individuals or, uh, or eight to nine, uh, out of 10 times, the kids will not develop AS. So something that's uh, uh, comforting and, and, and good to know. Okay, so when we talk about genes, again, the most important gene that comes to our mind is HLA-B27. Now, HLA-B27 is present in 7% of uh, our population, North America. If we go to different parts of the world, it's around 7%. It can be very high in, in, in certain populations. For example, in Haida Gwaii, the, the number can be as high as 50%. And in Japan, it's as low as less than 1%. So there is a va variation in the general prevalence of B27. But the most important fact to know that actually B27 is a normal gene. It's present in our system. Uh, it's pre it's it's a it's a, a kind of HLA B gene that is present there to help us uh, prevent infections happening. Um, just as an example, if you uh, if somebody is HLA B twenty seven positive, the chance of hepatitis C going on to become chronic hepatitis and leading on to um, cirrhosis of the liver is lower because we're protected against hepatitis C infection. The immunity is good uh, in HIV. Um, we have good protection because of HLA-B27 and the chance of HIV leading on to AIDS disease and progressive disease is lower because B27 again is protective. So how does HLA-B27 work in the body? And I've put together a very simple cartoon so that it's very easily understood. Uh, our antigen presenting cells are, are in circulation and uh, they go through the lymphatics, they go, th go through the different tissues and they're, and they're sniffing around for anything unusual in, in, this, in the body. So if there is a viral infection, as an example here, the antigen presenting cells will, will take up the, the, the virus, it'll break it down into understandable sequences, right? And the entire virus may be difficult to process for the immune system. So it breaks down uh, the virus or, or a bacteria or whatever is, is unusual for the body. Uh, it could be a cancer, a uh, cell line, anything that is out of the ordinary, it'll break it down and uh, it'll into these small pieces called peptides. And it is, it has, now these peptides have to be recognized by our attacking cells or, the, or our army of soldiers that will get rid of the virus. And for that, these peptides have to be presented to our uh, attacking army. And this is presented on a plate and a, and a killer cell will come in and will get rid of the virus or the virus infected cells. So essentially that plate on which this uh, peptide is presented to the T cell is essentially uh, what HLA-B27 is. So HLA-B27 is is a critical part of the antigen presenting cell. HLA-B27 has a specific sequence so that spe uh, particular uh, peptides and specific peptides can occupy that space and can be presented to T cells. And that's why 
It is beneficial for hepatitis C. It is beneficial for HIV. It may not be beneficial for other infections because other infections, peptides may not be able to sit on HLA-B27. So first of all, it's a normal um, antigen presenting molecule. It is specific for certain peptide sequences and uh, it is present in 7% of normal um, population. Okay, so let's move on. Now, the abnormal part is that the HLA B27 also carries with it a risk of ankylosing spondylitis and spondyloarthritis in general. And maybe the reason is that because it is a very specific antigen presenting molecule, it may be presenting something that the body doesn't like, and that leads to a, a reaction in the form of arthritis. And here is an example where if you overexpress human HLA B27 into a rat that normally doesn't have HLA molecules, right? You can see arthritis developing compared to normal to arthritis after B27 expression. You can see the nail changes of psoriasis developing, can change the skin changes of psoriasis developing, can see the colon, clearly it's different. This is a normal appearing um, uh, gut, and this is significant uh, colitis that develops in the B27 uh, positive rat. So clearly they develop arthritis. You can also have inflammation in the spine, peripheral joints, the nails of psoriasis, and also um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease like the, uh, like changes in the gut. So clearly B27 overexpression um, can lead to uh, disease as seen from this example. And now what is the impact of B27 positivity in SPA? So uh, the, the fact is that everybody is not HLA B27 positive. So being negative for HLA B27 does not exclude the diagnosis of uh, axial SPA. Um, but rather there are um, in, in fact, depending on, on which cohort you look at in Toronto, there is a mixture of many races and ethnicities uh, together in, in the city. And what we are seeing is B27 positivity is only around 80%. And, and sometimes depending on when you do the cut, it may be even lower. But 80 to 85 percentage of patients are B27 positive. Northern European uh, cohorts have reported up to 90 percent, but it's fairly high. So suffice to say that it, a very high proportion of patients uh, with AS have actually B27. However, uh, B27 positive negativity does not only that because 20 to 25 percent of patients can develop AS without B27. So, what does um, the presence of actually B27 in a patient with AS mean? Actually, there is not a big difference between B27 positive patients with AS and B27 negative patients with AS. Um, a little bit of a of, of difference that has been recognized. You know, if you look at um, radiographic sacroiliitis, where their uh, X-ray changes appear more in B27 positive or negative, it's not very consistent. But we have seen that. If you look at uh, the amount of spinal fusion that happens, B27 positive individuals over many years perhaps have slightly more severe spinal fusion. So progression may be slightly uh, faster with B27 positivity. Um, B27 positivity may be associated with more inflammation as you see in the MRI. Um, B27 positive individuals may develop disease earlier uh, than, than those without B27. So these are the main things that you see. There is also a report that uh, B27 positivity may also be associated with eye inflammation. Uh, again, um, again, something that may, may be safe, but we do have a significant proportion of patients who are B27 negative and also have UVI. something that we thought uh, was not the case, but when we analyzed it, we found that B27 negative individuals also have uveitis in, in our uh, cohort. So our cohort is in Toronto, just to give you an introduction. We have uh, nearly 2,000 patients with AXPA in our cohort that we have followed over uh, many, many years. And a lot of seminal studies have come out of because of this uh, ability to study patients over many years. And we have almost 20 years of data with um, um, clinical information, uh, blood, peripheral blood, uh, RNA, DNA, everything stored for, or, almost on an annual basis in these patients. So that's how we could do these uh, studies over a period of time. So what's new with this actually B27? I talked about why it is important and, and how clinically it may be relevant. So in over the last two, three years, there, there have been significant advances in our understanding. I will not take you through how B27 causes disease and everything because there are many theories behind that. I'll just talk about the more recent uh, advance. So um, Rob Inman uh, at, our, at our center, um, he who was my PhD mentor, 
uh, he is he does cutting edge uh, translational research in in ankylosing uh, spondylitis and uh, what he described here is that the the T cells the 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 killer cells that we talked about there so uh, the T cells uh, recognize specific peptides on HLA B27 and as a result of that uh, there is an expansion of these immune cells that are hyperactive. So when there is an expansion, and I, and it is called a clone frequency. So essentially what it means that if you are reacting against a particular peptide, a specific uh, T cell will increase in your blood circulation. Normally you have a hundred or thousands of different types of T cells circulating because it should be ready for anything that is coming in. Now, if AS is driven by a particular antigen, now if there is maybe, let's um, consider it to be a virus. It could be an endogenous antigen that is also present inside our joint. It may be present in the eye, it may be present in the gut. But once our cells start, uh, a cell has the capacity to recognize this and gets activated, similar looking cells increase because that cell will multiply and you'll get more of those similar cells. And that is called clonal frequency. And here is, um, and I'll take you through this very, very slowly. Black is B27 positive cases. So AS patients with B27. This is B27 negative um, AS patients. This is B27 positive controls. And essentially what you're looking for is the number of expansion or the expansion that you're seeing in patients. And you see that B27 positive AS patients have very high numbers of of, of expansion of T cells showing that it is being driven by some form of antigen. We still don't know based on this. We only know that you know B27 and T cells together are driving an immune response. We don't know what is driving it yet. And that's the big million dollar question, right? If we knew that we can just remove it from our system and hopefully we go back to normal, but that doesn't uh, does not happen yet. I'll skip this. So this is the most recent and highly talked about uh, paper. It was published in Nature. And it is a follow-up of, of what I just described. And the difference here is that the specific uh, type of cell has been identified in the study. This is just for reference. I, I don't want to take you through the full data. There is this, this is the title. If you're interested, you can note it down. And, and those who are more scientifically inclined can go in and try and read the paper. But essentially, from that expansion of the T cells that we saw in the previous study, here, we are homing in on what is driving the T cell. And we are trying to answer what is the antigen that triggers AS in, in, in us, in our, in, our, in our patients, right? So what they have done is, again, very broadly, patients with AS, peripheral blood is taken. Patients with uveitis, the, UV, the fluid from the eye is taken out. And the cells are isolated. And they undergo very deep studies to identify which cells are expanded. And from there, we reach this to say that these are the different kinds of antigens that are potentially driving the immune response. And as you can see, again, we are not down to one or two yet, but at least we have certain candidate um, antigens that may be driving AS. And out of these, one thing that has come out that is being pursued is a gut origin antigen that seems to drive, you probably have heard of this, reactive arthritis. Reactive arthritis essentially uh, responds to an infection where we develop arthritis because the body's response to that infection goes, you know, goes overboard and starts attacking the joints. And similarly, in this study, a gut origin um, bug related um, um, antigen has been found to be important. So we are slowly getting there. Um, we we are homing in on what B27 is actually doing in the system. We are trying to understand why everybody with B27 does not develop disease, why all AS patients do not need to be B27 positive, and what uh, antigen may be driving this uh, response in, in, in AS. So that's where we are at. But the flip side is, you know, we talked about 80 to 90 percent of patients being B27 positive. However, if you take the 7 percent of our population, all B27 positive individuals, we, we, you know, we, we, you know, the easy way to screen is just do B27 everybody, right? Unfortunately, that is not a good way to screen for AS because if you if you screen the 100 people and uh, if you find that 100 people are B27 positive, only two develop AS. 
the vast majority of individuals with HLA B27 do not develop disease. And that's because it is just a normal gene and it has not probably faced the trigger that we are looking for. And probably also because it is not just B27, there may be many other things that need to come together for the disease to develop. And if you and and if you look at this, this is one of the earliest um, genome-wide association studies. So you look at the entire genome of AS patients, and these are thousands and thousands of AS patients. And in addition to HLA B27, which is the strongest link, there are multiple other genes that were identified. And this was identified. For, th this explosion came in uh, around around 15, 20 years ago with the advent of this technology. And I'll show you a table just to give you an idea. So these are the top genes that have been linked to AS. What is interesting is you look at HLA B27, the odds ratio is 90, very, very high. The odds of developing disease is, is 90 compared to B27 negatives. But as soon as you go beyond B27 into all these amazing discoveries that we have done, the odds ratios are very, very, very low, okay? And if you put all of these genes together, including B27, still the heritability or the, the explanation of why genes transmit disease has, is, is come, or, or why multiple members in the same family develop disease is explained in only a quarter of, 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 of the possible 100%. So we still don't know why um, these genes are, de uh, maybe we are yet to identify the major genes that are involved. And this is also important because um, the other day, um, I uh, I had a, a patient walk into the clinic and it was mechanical back pain and um, multiple physicians had already diagnosed uh, that the back pain is mechanical and uh, it's a they don't need a biologic. The patient, however, came in with a full list of um, a genome wide study that they got done from a private company and um, it had a mutation in this gene, ERAP1, right? And they said, Look, I have an ERAP1 that is associated with AS, so I have AS. And I try, you know, this is important to understand. Um, a, a, it's, a, it's a very, 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 very minute risk factor by it's that itself it will not cause as and if you look at the variations it is that variation is present not in seven percent as in b27 in fact the variation is present in 30 to 40 percent of general population and there is no disease associated with in those uh, individuals so yes we have made progress but still our genetic studies can explain only around 25 percent of the heritability uh, that we see in in families now, this is, again, something quite new. I talked about that gene. That gene was ERAP1. And here is a study from Bob Colbert's uh, group in, at the NIH. And what they've done is they check out this gene, ERAP1, from, from the rats that we talked about earlier. There's those rats with HLA B27. They develop arthritis, right? They, you can see the arthritis here as well. When you take out that gene, ERAP1, the arthritis actually subsides. And you can see that in, in, in the images as well. So maybe there is something uh, in that genetic association that is amenable to therapy, but these are very early days. So something new that is that is developing in, in this field. Okay, now we'll uh, quickly move on to uh, treatment uh, of, of AXPA. Let me, uh, okay, let me take a quick look at the clock. I don't have a clock here, okay. So, we will start with the general uh, treatment options in AXPA slide. Okay. Pharmacological, non pharmacological, both treatment modalities important. And non pharmacological, we always talk about physiotherapy, home exercise, group exercises. All three are important. If you have the ability to get physiotherapy, if it's covered, if you're able, able to get your physiotherapist, that's excellent to get started on, on, on the best exercises for AS. Um, um, SAA has a, a nice uh, a booklet with a central sheet of, of all the uh, nice exercises that you need to do. We used to hand them out uh, quite a bit when we had access to that uh, before. Um, we uh, also have a, a picture of that on the wall so people can, can take a look at that. Um, now we also have um, a, a portal where uh, our physiotherapists have demonstrated the best videos and, and we direct them to that portal. Uh, home exercise and group exercises, and people have done studies, 
and it looks like um, if you were if you're able to come together as a team or maybe even two or three people together and do group exercises the benefits and your motivation is much better than doing exercises at home alone but the bottom line is exercise is better than no exercise so some form of exercise especially the core strengthening and stretching uh, is, is extremely important and when you come to pharmacological management, always the therapy starts with anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, Disease-modifying drugs like methotrexate, sulfasalicin, these are helpful for peripheral arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, or peripheral arthritis that have that may occur with uh, axial spa as well. However, it doesn't work for axial disease, right? Uh, if there is NSAID uh, failure uh, or it is suboptimal, the response then we go to biologic medications. Uh, yes, and this is uh, complete. So we we start we we started off with TNF inhibitors way back in in early two thousand. Um, uh, we have five different TNF inhibitors currently approved for treatment of of Paxpa. Um, re, well, more, uh, after that, IL seventeen inhibitors entered, and uh, they have been approved. We have at least two IL seventeen inhibitors that are, that are approved and currently being used for Paxpa. And uh, more, most recent addition to our toolkit is the jack inhibitors. And so we are fortunate and compared to uh, 1990s, we have so many options. Um, I still think that we haven't we, we are yet to find the the, the magic. Um, but th this is a major, major advance in our, our treatment uh, and for our patients with uh, Axpa. Um, other medications, now all of these medications are used in other conditions in rheumatology, like IL-6 inhibition is great for rheumatoid arthritis, IL-1223 is good um, for um, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and, and all the other, all uh, those have been tried in AXPA, but unfortunately, as you can see from the Red Cross, there is um, no uh, effect eff efficacy in, in axial uh, disease. Uh, you'll see here that for peripheral arthritis, I already mentioned these may be helpful. And these may be helpful for psoriatic arthritis and, and psoriasis. Um, now, IL-17 ANF um, is, is now available. It has been approved for uh, psoriasis already, and, and hopefully soon in Canada, it'll be approved for AXPA as well. The results look amazing, and uh, we, will, we will see those results. Now, this is a slide I just put up there just to you know show you that uh, we have five different TNF inhibitors, more or less. And this is not a head-to-head -head comparison. These are separate studies, so they cannot be compared to each other. But, you know, you see the top here is an ASAS 40 response. So roughly, uh, think of a 40% improvement in symptoms by six months of treatment. And around 45 to 50% of patients will have a 40% improvement by around six months. And this is the uh, data from clinical trials. And these are patients that have over 10 years of disease. So they're not early patients, they're established, well-established patients. And this is the kind of response you can uh, expect with these agents. All of them look similar, uh, but it's not 100%, right? Now let's look at uh, one of the IL-17 inhibitors. And uh, this is the data on secukinumab. And again, 40% uh, response uh, as well here. But this is a slightly earlier, around 16 weeks. And you can see, again, the same kind of um, response, around 40%, 45% with the standard dose of 150 milligrams uh, um, every month. And you can see that the response is lower if, if patients have already failed the TNF inhibitor because they have already established themselves as difficult to treat uh, patients. And you can see the response is slightly lower. Um, but, um, you know, that's a, so very similar to what we saw with TNF inhibitors. And um, uh, you know the last one I'll show you is one of the JAK inhibitors. This is the upadacitinib study, and again, a forty percent response, similar ballpark response. So we have these three different modalities: the TNF inhibitors, IL seventeen inhibitors, and JAK inhibitors. Forty-five to fifty percent chance of a forty percent improvement in in um, um, between um, three to six months of therapy. The outstanding questions question is really is the forty to fifty percent is that we see here is the same forty to fifty percent in all these diseases or maybe thirty percent response to jack inhibitors another thirty percent would respond to IL seventeen and another thirty percent would respond to TNF that would cover almost ninety to 
uh, percentage plus of patients. So can we do a personalized medicine approach by which we can run a test and, and find out what is the best modality of treatment so that we don't waste time and effort um, doing one biologic to next and, and wasting almost a couple of years before you land on something that works. Um, so this 40 to 50 percent response is to the first biologic, right? If you go to the um, if you go to the second biologic, the chance of response is usually slightly lower. I would say, you know, similar to the twenty five percent I showed you, I would say probably thirty to forty percent chance of response. So first, in our clinics, we see fifty to sixty percent chance of response to first, and then if they don't respond, we can capture another twenty to twenty five percent. So roughly. 70 to 80 percent of patients uh, will have response to one or the other uh, biologic, but uh, this may take time uh, homing in on the right one. Uh, Long-term results are also important because these don't keep working forever, right? For for a large number of patients, uh, we may have to either increase the dose or switch to another one over a period of three to four years. But there, we have definitely seen patients who have, who have been on the same biologic for 15 years with no issues. And uh, they, uh, they are really the, the, the lucky patients who where it keeps working year after year. And here is just an example of opodacetin where uh, we, the year two data, this is a more recent addition to Aspan. Aspan, it seems to maintain the response uh, over, over a period of time. Okay, let's we'll just get that. So this is the latest kit on the block, the Mekisimab. Yeah, I'm sure you've, you've heard of this. And this is from a, a study looking at uh, the Mekisimab in, in active AS. So the difference here is that um, um, IL-17 blockers so far that were available, the Ixikisimab and, and, uh, uh, and Secukinimab, both are blocking one of the IL-17s, which is IL-17A. And Bimekisimab blocks two IL-17s, IL-17 A and F. Okay, both A and F can, a, either F can form a homodimer or di two molecules of same IL-17 F together, or two molecules of IL-17 A together, or a heterodimer where IL-17 A and F can come together. And all of these three forms can attach to the receptor and cause activation of the immune system. So bimekisimab can block uh, these uh, different combinations. Uh, so the idea behind developing this molecule was that maybe because you're blocking two of the L17s, uh, maybe it's a, a better blocker and you get better responses. Well, you can see that um, bimekisimab uh, uh, also by around week 16 has a similar kind of a response. So um, not a home run here uh, either, but it works. It works and it will be approved soon and it should be available as a, as another modality of treatment for AXPA patients. Okay, I'm moving on to the window of opportunity. And it's extremely important that we recognize there is a window of opportunity for treating AXPA patients. And that is why uh, there is a, a lot of emphasis on identifying patients with AXPA early from the huge number of patients with back pain out there. Um, when patients come with uh, chronic back pain, the chance that the patient has actual AS as a cause of uh, the back pain is only 5%. If we are able to screen the kind of back pain and um, identify patients with inflammatory sounding back pain, still the chance of this being uh, because of AS is only 15% or so. So there is a huge there is a huge number of patients with chronic back pain, but identifying these patients early is, is difficult because there are no specific biomarkers. We already talked about B27 being not a good uh, screening test in, in the beginning. Um, so uh, we have to somehow find a way. Different models of care are being tried to make these um, diagnoses early. Early diagnosis would mean early treatment. And if you are able to treat these patients early, what is the benefit? Because early treatment means a higher chance of response. These 40 to 50% that we saw may be higher. I'll show you data, some data on that. A higher chance of drug-free remission as well. And this is something which I'm hoping is the case. I don't think there is strong data around it. But if you treat early, maybe the chronic pathogenic processes have not set in yet the chance of responding to treatment is higher and the depth of remission. So you may go into much deeper remission with all the immune systems under check if you treat early. And if that is the case, maybe we can go off the drug uh, over time uh, when these patients diagnosed early. And also, 
this is already proven. If you start early, the chance of the disease actually progressing is lower. It's lower. So, so there's so many reasons why we should be identifying patients early. And now let's look at this data. You remember the 40 to 50% number of uh, for the ASS40 response I showed you earlier. This should be ASS40, it's not ASS50. The ASS40 response in this study is much higher. So what is the difference here? It's, it's more than 60% chance. And this is partial remission, which is extremely difficult to achieve, which means that almost essentially almost all symptoms of AXPA are gone. And 50% plus patients have near partial remission. And, and what is the difference here? The difference here is that patients were treated with less than three years of symptoms and they had evidence of inflammation, right? So again, to show you the window of opportunity, the chance of not only higher number of patients responding, but also going into partial remission is much better if you start treating early. So keep, keep in mind window of opportunity for treatment. Now, this is the um, INFAST study. It's an old study, but I still like it because the design uh, answers one, one important question, and, uh, and I'll take you through the study. So very early on, these patients have not even seen anti-inflammatories in a full uh, full dose yet. Very early on, these patients um, with um, uh, enclosing spondylitis are identified, and they're straight away, they are randomized into receive a biologic infliximab uh, or just naproxen, right? And at week 28, if they go into remission, then the drug is withdrawn. So they're randomized to either continue only naproxen or no treatment, right? So the, the infliximab, infliximab is taken off. And the question is, if you treat AS like you treat cancer, if you come in strong with infliximab or any biologic for that matter, very early on, without waiting for weeks, trying NSAIDs and waiting for weeks, uh, trying to make a diagnosis, what is the um, what is the end result? Can you take the patient off infliximab and the patient will still be in remission or not? Now, the result here is, a, again, you look at week 28 data here, 62% of patients um, have, um, have an, an ASS response here at week 28, which is the primary endpoint. And with naproxen alone, you have 35% of uh, patients that have uh, responded um, um, at, at week 28. Um, if you stop treatment at this phase, if you stop treatment, what happens? At week 52, 47, nearly 50% of patients with just naproxen remain in, in remission. And 40% of patients without any treatment, not even with uh, naproxen, remain in remission. Again, showing you that if you treat early, there is a potential of us stopping treatment as well over, over uh, uh, a period of time. Okay. Um, the last part of the, um, uh, um, of, um, the window of opportunity is a bone formation uh, aspect. And you, you, you can see here from this example, um, this is a, a, a STIR sequence, which I'm pretty sure most of you who have had MRIs would have heard of this term, the STIR sequence. That is the key sequence that is required to pick up inflammation in, in axial SPA. And what you see as white here, that is the spinal fluid. So fluid appears white in the sequence and bone appears dark. Still, you're seeing some white in the bone, within the bone, the corners of the bone, some white. So why should there be fluid in the bone? That is because there is inflammation in the bone and that is being picked up by the STIR sequence. So this is clearly showing inflammation within the anterior part of the spine and the posterior part of the spine here. And if we try to look at the corners here, L2, L3, the lumbar vertebra, second and third, and L3, L4 corners, you see there is white in L2, L3, so there is inflammation in that corner. There is no inflammation in the lower corner. And if you see over a period of time, see where the bone has formed. The bone has formed where there was inflammation. So showing that if we can come in and control this inflammation very early on, maybe this bone formation can be prevented. So that's the whole idea. You control inflammation early, prevent the bone from fusing the spine. If you look at all the players that drive inflammation, the key downstream effect is all these cytokines, TNF, IL-17, IL-22, and triggering bone signaling and modulation. But in, in, in reality, it is a complex network. We, you, you cannot control most of these things. The most important thing that you can really do is, is reduce the inflammation by, um, by reducing these, these cytokines, right? 
And most recently in our lab, we have found a, a, a cytokine called MIF that seems to be driving inflammation. And we are working on identifying uh, therapeutic uh, ways to reduce MIF to reduce inflammation and bone formation. So let's go on to studies that have looked at um, uh, reducing rate of progression. Okay, so anti-inflammatories and the Enrada and study um, is, is a good study looking at the effect of NSAIDs uh, on progression. So this is the design of the study. Baseline x-rays and two-year follow-up x-rays are done. Patients either receive continuous naproxen or on-demand naproxen. And let, let's see what happens at the end of two years. The end, uh, this is just to show you that the continuous use group had roughly doubled the amount of uh, daily um, naproxen compared to those who could take it as and when required. And this is the end result. In fact, there was no difference, significant difference between the two groups. You see that the blue dots are the people who had continuous NSAID. In fact, you'll see that even if there is a slight difference, those who took continuous NSAID actually had slightly more progression. So the uh, consensus among um, the spondylitis uh, rheumatologist, spondylitis specialist, uh, is that NSAIDs are good for symptom control. Mm -hmm. If symptoms are well controlled, there is no need to keep continuing naproxen on a daily basis with the hope of reducing progression because there likely is no significant benefit with just an, uh, anti inflammatories alone uh, for AS patients. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next one. And this is uh, our study that we conducted across uh, North America. For, and this was the first study that showed that TNF inhibitors uh, could reduce the rate of progression in, in spondyloarthritis. And as you can see here, TNF inhibitor use was associated with more than 50% um, uh, decreased risk of uh, uh, progression. Um, and not only that, and here again, coming back to the window of opportunity, when you start TNF inhibitors is important. This is the rate of progression when you started within the first five years, as opposed to if you started after 10 years, look at the rate of progression. Clearly starting early means the higher chance of uh, reducing uh, the progression on the spine. Okay. Um, this is uh, some data on IL-17. We already talked about TNF inhibitors and progression, some data on IL-17 inhibitor and progression. Again, uh, similar, um, uh, this is the NRADA study we just discussed. So what, what has happened in this study, in this, um, uh, let me just take you back into this, this sikikinumab study is sikikinumab progression over two years with patients on sikikinumab was compared to the NRADA study here. So essentially this would be a group on anti-inflammatories and the second group would be patients on uh, sikikinumab. And you can see here that the change in um, uh, uh, radiograph, uh, radi radiographic progression is, is much lower than when on NSAID. So there seems to be an effect, but the, the, this, this was not statistically significant. So there appears to be an effect, but still we don't think we have proof that that is the case uh, uh, here. Okay, this again shows that there is no difference, um, a significant difference between just NSAIDs and IL-17 inhibitors. Um, to, this is uh, for the JAK inhibitor trofacitinib, and you can see here that uh, the SIJ MRI, this is a score for MRI inflammation. In the spine, as well as the SI joints, there is a significant reduction in the um, inflammation as opposed to placebo. So clearly the inflammation is, decre is decreasing. We have still no, don't have long uh, period of exposure to jack inhibitors and expert to answer the question whether actual bone formation is lower or not or not but because it is controlling inflammation in the spine likely that is the case okay and then the last part uh, of uh, of what i wanted to discuss is the uh, um, tapering of uh, biologic dmats so i i, I we have already started following this in in, in the in the toronto uh, clinic uh, in fact, we also have a trial going on called BioDisc or Biologic Discontinuation Study that um, uh, Dr. Patricia Ramalante, one of our clinical fellows, is, is, is leading. Um, the question is, if you are in sustained remission over a period of time, can we uh, reduce the dose of um, um, the biologic over a period of time and ultimately hopefully stop the biologic in routine clinical practice? So that's the question. And and. Uh, um, here is some data that supports this notion. Okay, so the first one was from the Ability Three study, 
where patients on adalimumab uh, were given 28 weeks uh, on adalimumab. And if they were in sustained remission by week 28, they were either continued on the same dose of adalimumab or completely stopped. So only placebo given. So the question here is, can you stop the biologic? Not reducing the dose, stop the biologic. And let's see what happens. 673 patients were enrolled. 305 patients uh, and gave, came into remission, which is pretty good numbers, right? Pretty good numbers in remission. And then at the end, the uh, the, the proportion of patients um, who did not experience a flare were calculated. And you can see here that if you stop the biologic, here almost 50% of patients flare within the first 40 weeks itself, right? So completely stopping the biologic is not a good idea compared to continuing uh, the, the, the uh, biologic on, on full dose. But this is a more important question to answer. And this is from the C optimized study. So patients were on open label uh, certlizumab, but for a longer period here, because you need sustained, um, sustained uh, remission. And after 48 weeks, then uh, if they were in sustained remission at, at the almost near the end of the year, then they were either continued on the full dose, so no reduction, or half dose. So instead of every two weeks, they go to every four weeks or completely stop. So here the question is, can you stop it? Or can you reduce the dose by 50% or do you really need to continue full dose after you're in sustained remission? And let's see what the results are. You can see it clearly here. Stopping is not good. A significant, almost 80% have uh, relapsed by the end of week 48, not good. But if you reduce the dose, not much of a difference. Look at the response. At uh, 48 weeks, 80, 82 to 84 percentage continue to uh, maintain the remission. So reducing the dose by 50 percentage is in fact uh, feasible. And you can see that it is not much of a difference whether the patients have radiographic changes or no radiographic changes or non-radiographic axis. So it works in both groups of patients. And similarly for IL-17 inhibitors, the same is the case. And this is from the Ixacizumab study, the coast-wise study. Similarly, exocisumab is given up to week 24, and then they are randomized to either half dose or withdrawal, and we'll go straight to the data here, okay? The proportion of uh, flare-free patients, you can see 55% would flare if you take off the drug, but there is not much of a difference if you continue uh, with reduced dose as opposed to full dose. So also for the IL-17 inhibitors, that appears to be the case. You can reduce the dose without much uh, risk of uh, flare compared to continuing. And similar results here also between radiographic and non-radiographic axial SPA. So it works in both groups of patients. And also you can see um, that uh, this in a different format. If you completely stop the drug, high risk of uh, um, uh, flare and, and, and uh, unlike if you continue, and this size slide I put there just so that you see when the flares happen, right? So the risk of flares obviously increases with time. But within the first year, if you stop treatment, you may not see a major flares appearing. So we may think that we don't need the drug because almost for several weeks, there is no disease. But actually, by year two and all, there is a significant increased risk of uh, flares happening if you completely stop the drug cold turkey like that. Uh, the good news, however, is that you can recapture um, uh, the, the, uh, those patients who have flared back. And you will see that low disease activity can be achieved in 96% of patients and almost inactive disease can be achieved in nearly uh, three quarters of, of patients. So there is a possibility of uh, recapturing uh, a disease in most patients if, if there is a flare. So I think I'll stop there with a summary of what we uh, discussed today. We talked a little bit about the pathogenesis, the importance of B27, why it is important for uh, clinical uh, in the clinical setting as well, the latest advance of how we are homing in on what may be driving the immune response that is sitting on B27 and, and causing the arthritis. Uh, still miles to go, but very good progress as of late. Uh, we talked about uh, the similarity in response to all three modalities of treatment, TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, and JAK inhibitors. So novel modalities available now are the JAK inhibitors and soon, hopefully, the IL-17 A and F inhibition. There is a window of opportunity and there are multiple levels to think about why there is a window of opportunity. So early diagnosis is extremely important and biologic tapering is feasible, um, but not abrupt uh, stopping of, of the drug.
Okay, so I think I will stop there, stop the share, and then we can take questions. Thank you, Dr. Haroon, for your presentation. It was very informative. Um, okay, we got a lot of questions during your presentation. It looks like they're still coming in. Uh, I just want to remind people that um, uh, I'm gathering them and I'm going to read them out loud for Dr. Haroon to answer. Um, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can during this next 34 minutes. Um, all right, so let's start with the first question. Is it common for rheumatologists to try many options over a long period of time to figure out the right cocktail to support pain and stiffness? And how long does it take someone to figure out the right meds to feel whole again? Yeah, great question. And again, the, the, the problem lies um, in the fact that we still don't have a definitive biomarker uh, to identify these patients. And also we don't have um, an algorithm to follow um, that uh, that correctly tells us which drug works for which patient. And, and also if, if a drug works at all uh, for patients, that's important to know. So um, in routine clinical practice, I would say that if the diagnosis is confirmed and also how strong the diagnosis, uh, what, what evidence it is based on. For example, if I have a patient with very strong MRI signal of inflammation, they're B27 positive, and the x-rays also show evidence of uh, changes over years, and the blood shows evidence of inflammation with high CRP and ESR. In my mind, the chance of that patient responding to any of the biologics would be probably 80, 90%, 80% at least in, in my mind, because Everything is is active in the patient. So if you try and suppress the inflammation with any of these agents, the patient should benefit. Now, as we take out each of these components now and go to, let's say somebody has MRI evidence of inflammation, that's the only thing and nothing else is present. And probably in my mind, I would think the chance of response is around 50%, 60%. If MRI also is negative, but I strongly feel in my mind that this patient has AS, but I do an MRI, it's negative, B27 is negative, your blood doesn't show inflammation, but this patient looks like having AS. If I just go with a gut feeling, probably still in my mind, the chance of response is not zero, but it's only maybe 10 or 20 percentage, right? And as we have more evidence in the beginning, the chance of response is much higher, and that is what we have seen. We have actually systematically done a study in our clinic looking at what predicts response. And the best predictor was not MRI, was not X-ray. For us, the best predictor was HLA B27. So if you make a clinical diagnosis and the patient has HLA B27, the chance of response was the best in those uh, patients. So I, you know, going from one drug to the other uh, before arriving at a conclusion, it all depends on, on the the level of inflammation and how strong the disease is based on all these components. So if if you are if you try to go one after the other on, on, on multiple biologics for the last type of patient that I mentioned, where only in my in, it's a gut feeling, I don't have any basis for the diagnosis, probably you will never uh, achieve a significant improvement. The the last uh, piece also is that uh, Pain may not entirely be related to inflammation. Patients with AS, we have seen over a period of time, also develop chronic pain issues. The threshold of pain can drop, and so the level of control that is required to achieve pain control may be much, much higher than those who don't have that pain syndrome as well. Uh, another thing to consider. So yes, it, it may take time in certain individuals, depending on the, the, the factors that I mentioned, uh, but not in everybody. Thank you. How important is the gut microbiome in AS? Yeah, again, another million dollar question. Um, we are what we eat is 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 is, is the saying, right? Is that uh, and um, um, well, the um, the 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 important thing to know is that if you look at animal studies, if you look at AS patient studies, if you look at HLA B twenty seven individuals who don't have disease. There is a difference in the gut 
uh, microbiome between those with and without um, uh, these findings. So B27 positive individuals are, have a different microbiome from B27 negative individuals. AS patients have a different microbiome from those who don't have AS. Uh, animal models with spondyloarthritis have a different microbiome from uh, compared to those without. So clearly there is a difference. The question is, does the difference come as a result of disease or is there a difference that is driving the disease process? I don't think we have answered that yet. But if you look at animal studies, there seems to be a case to be made where maybe the microbiome changes may in fact be driving the immune response. I already talked about the specific T cell uh, receptor that, that, that the T cells that get um, amplified in AS patients, that's probably being driven by a microbe in, in the gut. Um, is there evidence uh, that uh, microbiome uh, changing, altering the microbiome can change disease progress? I don't think there is strong evidence, but anecdotally, I have had patients who have come in and say that if they change their diet dramatically, they feel much better. So it's just anecdotal evidence. I do believe there is a link, but um, how much can we uh, can we can we rely on that to control disease? I'm not sure because it's such a um, variable thing. If you now today I've come to the US, I'm, I'm, I'm actually in a different city from where I live. Already in two days, my microbiome might have changed from what I had two days ago, right? It's such a variable and dynamic thing. So how well can you connect it to disease process? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We had several questions that came uh, in related to people are wondering what the risk is with taking a biologic for with the risk of cancer can you talk about that a little bit yeah yeah uh, you know um, way back in 2001 and two when the when the medication was was introduced you know the medic the tnf inhibitors it comes from tumor necrosis factor inhibitor right and um it, 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 it tnf is important for necrosis of tumor so if you take away tnf maybe you'll have a lot more tumors there's it's a genuine, it was a genuine concern, more, not only that, we all know that our immune system, um, and I gave you the example of cancer cell as well when we talked about our HLA B27 story. So uh, protection against cancer is mediated through our immune system. So if you suppress the immune system, would we be increasing our risk of cancer? That's a genuine question. And for the first five or 10 years, we were also worried about it. But now, if you so, if you started two thousand and one, now we have nearly twenty five years of nearly twenty five years of uh, experience with biologics, and I would say that in in axial SPA patients, we are much more confident uh, than 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 the initial initial phase that we may not be putting patients at risk, risk for cancer, and primarily in axial SPA patients, the risk of cancer is not that high. Now, have I had patients who have developed cancer? Yes, I've had patients who. Very few patients have developed lymphoma, for example. I've uh, had uh, patients uh, on TNF inhibitor who have gone on to develop lymphoma. Do I believe that is the cause of lymphoma? I don't think so, because um, um, if, if you take the example from rheumatoid arthritis, the initial study suggested that um, um, there is an increased risk of lymphoma in patients on TNF inhibitors. But further analysis showed that actually rheumatoid arthritis is a very high inflammatory state and that itself is associated with an increased risk of lymphoma. If you take TNF inhibitors out of the equation, still there was an increased risk of uh, cancer there. So because of all of these reasons, we are more and more confident that cancer may not be a very strong link with TNF inhibitors. When I counsel patients when they start this, you have to balance the risk and benefit, right? The risk of, of going untreated with pain every day, quality of life affected, family life affected, and the risk of progression, not only in the spine, but also 35% uh, increased risk of uh, dying from heart attacks, 60% increased risk of dying from strokes, because long-term inflammation can lead to um, coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease. So all of these risks, when you consider with that um, uh, with the potential risk of cancer, definitely the risk far outweigh um, um, when you when you look at the risk that it, of not treating, it far outweighs the risk of treating. So I would say that the benefit far outweighs it. If you ask me, is there evidence of um, cancer with TNF inhibitor? I would say that currently the evidence doesn't suggest there is evidence of uh, cancer risk. Now, would there be a small proportion 
uh, because you're suppressing immune system, always in the back of our mind, you're suppressing immune system. There can be an adverse effect uh, either because of increase of infections or maybe there is a chance of, of cancer developing, but it's very, very, very minute if there is any. Okay, thank you. What is considered early for treatment? And then what is your preferred first line treatment for a newly diagnosed individual with AXPA? Yeah. Very good question. So early treatment for pneumonia would mean hours, right? <laughs> uh, early treatment for rheumatoid arthritis would mean weeks. Um, early treatment for AS, it is difficult uh, because um, back pain, um, you know, the back pain is so common and uh, you don't even go to a physician in very uh, early days of uh, back pain because you may think it is a sprain or it's just a sports injury or something like that. So as of now, early uh, disease in AS, some people consider it two years. Some people may go up to five years. I would consider it within the first two years. So if you treat patients within the first two years, you know the results will be much better than within the first five years and definitely much better than uh, after 10 years. So uh, I, would, I would take the first two years as the early phase of uh, AXPA. Okay. Uh, you in talking about early diagnosis, uh, this writer says, I'm an African American female who complained about symptoms that I was having. I was dismissed and told to take two Tylenol for pain. Now, 40 years later, I was diagnosed with AS. I know that 95% of people with this diagnosis are from Eastern European descent. I would like to know how doctors can be educated about noticing. AS in black people. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, very, very important question there. And I still remember um, this was uh, how many years ago? 25? Uh, yeah, in, 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 in um, I think early 2000s. So um, I was um, doing ward rounds and um, there was a, a female patient who had back pain. Um, and the, we looked at the x ray. I was completely fused. So I was thinking, oh, wow, a female with a completely fused spine. At that time, and this was not a long, long time ago, this was around 20 years ago, the feeling was that, you know, maybe females may, may you know, have much lower risk of developing it. And not only that, the chance of it, the spine fusing is also much lower. So that concept definitely has, has uh, changed over time. And now if you look at with the advent of MRI, some other cohorts have females much more than males. So that's one part of the thing. So diagnosing uh, this condition in, in females. Now, racial and ethnic variations. Again, I would say that um, there, there may be an element of, um, of, the, of the value of B27 in different ethnicities. Now, for, as an example, I mentioned that B27 in Japanese individuals, in the general population, if you do a test, it's less than one percentage, right? But if you do the B27 testing in, um, in, in, in North America, it's 7%. So it's, you see B27 positive much more common. But if you have somebody with back pain and comes in with a B27 positive test in Japan, the physicians would think, oh, this is much more important because it should be present in only 1%. So there is the relative value is much different. So that may be another uh, element to it. And the third part would be, I would say, access to care. And that definitely is is an issue, and and that's not specific for for AS. It's in general for all medical conditions. There can be a problem of access to care between different ethnicities and and um, and and races. So, oh, we should be we should be uh, working on all three levels. Uh, whether it is the fact that um, um, male female, there is not much of a difference in the incidence. Females who come with a back pain have an equal um, chance of having this because of a uh, spondyloarthritis or inflammation as, a, as as any male walking into the clinic with back pain. That's the first thing to know. Um, the differences in B27 um, uh, between different uh, races and ethnicities should be educated and the relative value of that in different ethnicities should be uh, understood. Um, and the last piece would be, you know, trying to remove the barriers and, and variations in, in access to care, um, starting from health education level, right, right through the healthcare systems changes and models of care changes so that everybody has equal access to care. 
Um, beyond that, um, you know, equity and, and, and diversity is a huge thing for uh, Canadian Rheumatology Association. We have formed and we are working very, um, uh, very closely with uh, EDI uh, consultants so that we can develop processes in which uh, we are much better uh, clinicians at the end of the day. Yeah. Thank you. So how how does a person know if they should change meds? For example, the biologic doesn't seem to be working as well as it did. Should they switch to another TNF, change to an IL-17 or JAK inhibitor? Because um, the concern is they'll get worse if they leave their current medication. So is it worth the risk to change meds? Yeah, I, um, that's a very important question that we face. And it all uh, depends on where you're at in your journey. So if um, the patient, uh, this is the first biologic, and there was a fantastic success for, let's say, four years or five years, and clearly you're noticing there is a difference uh, from nearly 80% improvement, no, you would grade it as well, I've come down to 50% or 40%. So there is a point there. And if you feel that this is this is appears to be worsening even more, it's not a very short-term flare. It appears to be worsening over several weeks. And there is a case definitely to change it because there are so many options left, right? I, I wouldn't uh, worry about changing in that situation. Now, the Second situation is, uh, let's say you're on your first biologic or second biologic, and you have not had 80 or 90% response. Let's say you were only 40 or 50% better, but clearly was better than before. And at the end of a year or so, you feel that, nah, I've got, I'm not improving further. I'm still having significant pain. So the question would be, have we really optimized treatment because you were only 50% better? You were not really uh, 80 or 90% better. Maybe there is an element of the pain uh, threshold issue here that I mentioned earlier. For maybe there is secondary fibromyalgia that we need to control. So that needs to be investigated. And this would be one of the situations where a repeat, one of those rare situations where a repeat MRI may be beneficial. If the first MRI showed inflammation and uh, you are not sure if this um, flare you've been experiencing or the lack of response you've had over the uh, more recently, is because of a failure of the drug or, or because you have not controlled pain pathways um, optimally, then that would be a situation where maybe an MRI may be helpful if it shows a lot of inflammation, makes the decision much easier to switch. Um, the other situation that we face is, you know, you've gone through four biologics, five biologics, and you finally found something that works nearly 40%, 50%, you're not, uh, it was not a home run. But you've been on this drug for, you know, maybe years together, and have had patients who, 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 who found something that works much better than others, and uh, and then you end up with a flare. So this is a much more difficult situation because you don't know what the next one would be. If there are two or three other options, you don't know if by stopping this, the next one would be better, or you lose the efficacy of this one as well. And if you try to go back onto this. There are two issues there. One, you may be, have become resistant. The other issue is you're already telling the, the payers, whether it's the insurance company or the government, that this drug is not working. You need to go to the other. And then if you go back and say, I need to go back to the one which I already mentioned was not working, they may not give access. So from a payer perspective and also from a human immune response perspective, uh, stopping and going back to the previous drug may not be uh, ideal. So in this situation, we really have to discuss the physician and the patient really has have to discuss what is the best option forward and, and uh, weigh, weigh these options and, and take a decision. Thank you. Do any of the medications used for the treatment of AS impact male fertility? They're doing some family planning and concerned about that. More specifically, they asked about uh, solicoxin. Sulfasalicin, yeah. Yeah, so, so um, um, sulfasalicin has been reported before to reduce the sperm count. Um, so it, it is a completely reversible uh, one. So if you stop it, it usually improves. Um, um, so that is something if, if there is infertility, sulfasalicin uh, can be avoided. Okay, so that's one thing. And the other uh, part of infertility to keep in mind is even NSAIDs. NSAIDs um, can affect the implantation of the embryo in very early stages of pregnancy. So if infertility is, is an issue, then maybe NSAIDs in very early stages may also be something to consider uh, to avoid. 
other than that, um, for infertility, I don't think there is um, a major issue with the other treatment modalities. Yeah. Of course, you, you know that methotrexate should be avoided when you're trying pregnancy. That you all know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is it typical for someone diagnosed with the AS to experience pain in their feet and hands? How should this be treated? So, sorry, repeat that. And, Is it you. typical for someone with AS to experience pain in their feet and hands? Yeah. And how should that be treated? Yeah, so um, a few things to consider here. Um, the, um, first of all, 40% of patients can have peripheral arthritis. And the most common joints that are affected uh, in AS patients are usually large joints. So the kind of arthritis you see, it would be large joint, lower limb more than upper limb. So knees, ankles, feet more than hands and elbows. Asymmetric um, arthritis. So usually one side is more affected than the other. Uh, these are the main, and, and these patients are usually negative for rheumatoid factor and it's a zero negative kind of arthritis. So that's the kind of peripheral arthritis you expect with ankylosing spondylitis. So if there is clearly evidence of synovitis or inflammation in the joints, and that may be because one, the AS may not be well controlled. The other thing to consider is, is there an associated condition like psoriasis or is there inflammatory bowel disease, right? These two conditions can also be associated with inflammation in the peripheral joints. Now, the last piece I would say is um, uh, pain in the uh, in the feet especially may not be arthritis. It could be enthesitis like plantar fasciitis, right? Which can be very common in patients with spondyloarthritis. It can be tendonitis, for example, Achilles tendon in women, so heel pain. So these need to be uh, ruled out and, and maybe it's because maybe it's an indication of suboptimal um, uh, control of inflammation in these patients. Okay. We got several questions related to this, but is it possible for a significantly fused individual to stop the fusion if they're on a TNF inhibitor like Embrel? And then do you know of any new research to undo bone fusion or any new techniques in orthopod orthopedics to remove spinal bone fusion? Yeah. So um, the, again, uh, we talked about the window of opportunity concept. So if patients have started on a biologic at a very early stage, there's a chance of um, reducing the rate of progression. I don't think we can say we can stop progression. There may be, um, there may be um, you know, scientists and physicians out there who may say that we don't have direct evidence of this. That is true. Like you, you cannot keep patients on a biologic for five years or ten years, and and a separate group of patients on no treatment for this long period of time to prove that uh, you can stop progressions because. You cannot design a study. It's not ethical to do a study like that. We are following um, observational cohorts like ours that we have in Toronto. We have multiple such cohorts around the world. If you put patients together and look at those who have been on the biologic and those who have not been on the biologic, there seems to be much more progression than those who have not been on a biologic. And that is the reason for our statement that it appears to slow progression. I don't think it can completely stop progression unless you are really, really, really early on coming in. Now, um, regarding reversing something that has already fused. I don't think that is feasible. Uh, if there is a pro process of bone formation already in a specific anatomic location, if you go and try and chip away on that and try and manipulate that, I think it will only trigger even more uh, bone formation. Like, for example, you break a bone, the fracture healing, he heals with a big, big callus and, and, and wound heal scar, right? Similarly, if you go in and chip away at the spine, I think it'll just trigger more bone formation there and, and much worse uh, spinal fusion in that location. So it's not possible. Spinal surgeries are done uh, if there is a fracture of the fused area. Sometimes that can be really painful and you can fracture it by by, by manipulation or, or some, some, some other um, maneuvers. And then the the surgeon might have to go there and fuse that 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 area. So other than that, um, there is no way to reverse spinal fusion. However, keep in mind that um, re reduced mobility may not all be because of spinal fusion. Reduced mobility can also be because of inflammation and stiffness in the muscles. Um, 
if when you control inflammation, the inflammation stiffness goes away, the mobility can improve as long as it is the mobility is not restricted by complete fusion. So that's to be kept in mind. Yeah. Thank you. Is the diagnosis and treatment different from women and men? Yeah, so there are um, um, sex-based uh, differences in, in diagnosis, progression of disease, and treatment. So um, the bottom line is, the, the processes are the same. The treatment modalities are the same. There is no difference there. However, when it comes to uh, diagnosis, we see that um, uh, when you look at x-ray changes uh, and especially the spinal changes, uh, there seems to be more spinal fusion happening in males. So if it's advanced stages of, of disease, you in, when you're at the stage of diagnosis, you may be able to see that uh, more in males. Again, we talked about that um, over the years, the concept has changed. So now more and more people have rec recognized that males and females have an equal uh, chance of developing disease. So it shouldn't be the case. And if there is still a, 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 a delay in diagnosis in females, uh, then that's probably because of um, our, our outreach is not appropriate. And we need to continue educating uh, physicians that females also have an equal risk of developing disease. When it comes to treatment, um, females generally have less uh, long-term uh, response compared to males. The chance of failure is much higher in females compared to males. There's a um, uh, slight, uh, slightly better um, response to drugs in males, uh, and we don't know the exact reason why. Um, when it comes to long-term changes, I already mentioned the females have an advantage. They have less risk of progression over time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Have there been any studies of COVID NAS and are there any connections uh, uh, connections of those with AS diagnosed after getting COVID-19? No, no, there is, there is no increased uh, risk of AS uh, or increased risk of uh, COVID uh, if you look at it in, in either, either direction. And in fact, uh, people have looked at whether the use of biologics increases the risk of COVID or not. There doesn't seem to be the case. And in in fact, um, the long-term, long, uh, if you're on a biologic, obviously you are immunosuppressed for any infection, not just COVID, no, not specifically COVID, for any infection, there is an increased risk because it's a respiratory uh, virus. But if you look at long-term um, COVID-related um, morbidity and mortality, in fact, those who are on biologic have a slightly lower risk, probably because the bad effects of COVID are related to significant inflammation being set in and you're on if you're on immunosuppressant that chance is lower. All right, thank you. We have a couple more minutes. Um what is the next step if a medicine has lowered all of your inflammatory markers but you're still experiencing a lot of pain? It's, a, it's an important uh, uh, you know uh, thing to consider. So just as an example, uh, CRP or ESR is elevated in only around 30 to 40 percent of individuals. For those in, in whom this this is elevated, let's say CRP is like 20 or so with a normal of five or six. Now in that situation, um, if you if you go on if you go on a biologic and if you repeat um, the uh, CRP in in just four weeks or six weeks, CRP just crashes. It comes down to normal within no time. So it's a very, very sensitive marker, very early uh, marker, but it decreases very rapidly. And it's not a good marker for following patients uh, over long term. And uh, first of all, the reason, first of all, is that um, only 30% have, have, have this elevation. So it cannot be used in the 70% of patients where it's not elevated. And in those also where it is elevated, it drops within weeks. Um, while the pain may not respond for almost months. So as a follow-up for treatment monitoring, I don't think it's a great uh, ma marker. Now, if you have responded with, um, if you look at the MRI, MRI is improved. If the uh, inflammatory parameters have also dropped, what do you do next? Then we all we have to make sure uh, that um, we are we have optimally controlled pain pathways as well. So that would be, and then exercises would be added on to it to help uh, the proprioception and and all the uh, pain fibers as well to get um, get managed well. Okay, are there any effective alternative medicine modalities that work? For example, any studies with CBD? 
Uh -huh. um, so I'm not aware of a formal uh, clinical trial of CBD in, in AS specifically, but CBD obviously has been studied in, in chronic pain. Uh, our personal experience has been that you know patients have found it helpful. Um, 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 so they, they, they come to us requesting assessment for CBD. We don't do that ourselves. We send them to a pain clinic and they get assessed by the pain physicians. And if they feel that CBD is a good modality, that can be tried. The other uh, thing that patients tell us is that the effect benefits of CBD are very short lasting. So you need to, you probably need to increase, um, do it in multiple um, uh, times through the, through the day. To really get sustained benefits, it, um, uh, they tell us that it's, it helps with, uh, relaxes them for maybe uh, three to four hours, but then the efficacy goes away that fast. So it's not a long lasting and um, um, solution, but definitely something that can be considered, especially for those where the inflammation control alone is not enough in the early days. Yeah. Okay. I think this is going to be our last question. Okay. Um. For those who are HLAB negative, uh, 27 negative, if they have children who are diagnosed with AS, are the children more likely to respond to uh, best the same biologic as their parent? In other words, does a biologic that works best have to do with genetics or does it have to do more with whatever the trigger was that made the problematic gene express in itself? Yeah, a uh, great question, but unfortunately, I don't think we have uh, much data to answer that. Um, you know, people have looked at um, genome-wide association studies and looked at all the genes that are linked to AS to see if we can uh, predict TNF response. You know, very variable uh, um, uh, um, results there from cohort to cohort. People have looked at specifically TNF. Um, polymorphisms or changes within the TNF gene to see if a TNF inhibitor can work or not. Again, not, not, not great results there. What we are currently studying is taking individual cells from patients and sequencing each individual cell uh, separately to see maybe particular changes within individual cells may help predict those who are responding or not. We have um, we we have very early uh, evidence to suggest that maybe one of the molecules in a particular cell line is important. It's still very early days. We are still working on that. Um, I don't know of any other ways to predict exactly what works or not when it comes to twins or when it comes to the same family. In my mind, it 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 must be linked to the same process because they share genes. So the same kind of immune response should be there and hopefully they work uh, uh, similarly. But I've had experience, practical experience otherwise, where one drug works for one brother, it doesn't work for the other brother, right? So I would say we don't have enough uh, data to answer that question realistically. But I would expect, and anecdotally, I would like to expect that um, uh, because these processes are likely to be similar, um, the biologic may also be similar what they respond to. Yeah. All right. We are out of time for questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Haroon. We appreciate you so much sharing your expertise and generosity of your time to come here today and give that wonderful presentation and then take the time to answer questions. Um, so 